Let's take a look at the poem, A Far Cry from Africa by Derek Walcott. Derek Alton Walcott was one of the foremost literary figures from West Indies, whose works explore the myriad nuances of Caribbean culture. As a poet from St. Lucia, he extolled the beauty and inimitability of his native land through his poetry. His poems focus on the racial and cultural tensions that are part and parcel of the colonial experience. His dichotomous self that is torn between the colonizer's culture and the native tradition is evident in most of his works. In his illustrious career, he won a number of prestigious awards and was the Nobel Laureate in 1992. Walcott is a prolific writer who has published several collections of poetry. Let's take a look at his major works. In a Green Night, Poems, 1948 to 60, which was published in 1962. Selected Poems in 1964. The Castaway, published in 1965. The Gulf in 1969. Another Life in 1973. Sea Graves, that was published in 1976. Star Apple Kingdom in 1979, The Fortunate Traveller in 1981, Midsummer in 1984, Omarose in 1990, and this is considered to be his magnum opus, The Bounty in 1997, The Prodigal in 2004, and White Egrets in 2010. Apart from the poetry collections, he has also published a number of plays. I've just listed out a few of them. Dream on Monkey Mountain in 1967, Tijin or Tijin or Tijon and His Brothers, which was published in 1958, Pantomime in 1978, The Odyssey, a stage version in 1993. A short introduction to the poem, A Far Cry from Africa. The poem externalizes the internal conflict raging within Walcott. He is torn between his British upbringing and his African lineage and the ensuing tension finds an outlet through his works. The poem analyzes the multi-tiered conflicts that rise on account of the clash between the colonizer's privileged perspective and the frustrated responses generated from the muted discourse of the colonized. The poet specifically refers to the Mau Mau uprising that shook the social fabric of Kenya in the 1950s. Unhappy with the colonial rule and the strict regulations, some members of the Kikuyu tribe of Kenya formed the Mau Mau organization. The uprising soon turned especially violent and many people were killed. The poet here doesn't take sides and he uh, condemns the violence of both the whites and the Mau Mau rebels. The poem is written in free verse and it has no regular rhyme scheme. The title of the poem is rather ambiguous. Is the poet referring to a distant cry from Africa? As he heard the cries echoing from the distant Africa? Or is he referring to his physical distance from Africa. Walcott grew up in the island of uh, St. Lucia and was only familiar with the idea of an African motherland during his early years. It was much later in his life that he came to know more and more about Africa. Or uh, is he suggesting that the situation is not as it seems on the surface and that the events are far removed from the Africa of popular imagination? As he comes to know more about Africa, is he disillusioned that it is not the idealized homeland that he thought it was? Now let's analyze the poem in detail. A wind is ruffling the tony pell of Africa. Kikuyu, quick as flies, pattern upon the bloodstreams of the veld. Corpses are scattered through a paradise. Only the worm, kernel of carrion, rice, 
waste no compassion on the separate dead. The poet begins by imagining Africa as an animal, probably the tawny mane of a lion. Its tawny pelt is being gently ruffled by the wind. A very beautiful image. Tawny is uh, an orangish brown color and it is often associated with the continent of Africa. And this tranquil image is brutally shattered in the next line when the poet compares Kikuyu, one of the largest tribes of Kenya, to flies that gorge on the blood of Africa. Kikuyu, quick as flies, batten upon the bloodstreams of the veld. The veld or the felt uh, refers to the African grasslands. Another ideal image is shattered when the poet compares Africa to a place that is littered with corpses. It is no longer the paradise that one imagined it to be. Rather, it is a hellish place where dead bodies are strewn left and right. It is now a paradise destroyed by human violence. Such a gruesome sight will shock everybody except the worms that feed on the dead bodies. The worms are here referred to as the kernel of carrion. And this phrase is indicative of the colonial powers who brought death and destruction to Africa. The worms are happy that there is death as they can feed on the rotting flesh. The image is especially grisly and sickening and the poet wants to emphasize the image of a bleak wasteland created by human agency. And uh, the worm cries, waste no compassion on this separate dead. No compassion is required for the dead and this is probably a reference to the Mau Mau rebels who separated themselves from their tribe. Or it could also mean the dead who are separate from the world of the living. Statistics justify and scholars seize the salient of colonial policy. What is that to the white child hacked in bed to savages expendable as Jews? The poet says that death is now no longer a human tragedy. It's just statistical data verified and stated by the experts. Analysts can yield the cold data, but who can describe the pain and anguish suffered by the humans who fell prey to this tragedy? Who will take into account the lack of humanity displayed in such meaningless acts of violence? The colonial powers definitely will not treat the rebels with sympathy and the poet is by no means advocating sympathy for the violence that the rebels engendered. When people present the cold analysis of data, in this case the total number of deaths, it doesn't really matter to the white child killed by the rebels or the rebels murdered by the colonial powers. The poet condemns the violence on both sides. The innocent white child who was killed by the rebels has the poet's sympathy as he cannot understand such cruelty. The rebels were brutally eliminated by the British colonial powers and the poet cannot condone this act of violence either. The rebels were considered as savages by the colonial masters and in the colonial discourse, their deaths are justified. They rebelled and so they had to be killed. The savages are here likened to the Jews. Just as the Jews were exterminated by the Nazis on the basis of their racist ideology, the rebels were killed off by the colonial masters. The poet is here reflecting on the universality of human nature. Humans are horribly cruel and this is the same everywhere. Threshed out by beaters, the long rushes break in a white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civilization's dawn from the parched river or beast-teeming plain. 
The violence of beast on beast is read as natural law, but upright man seeks his divinity by inflicting pain. Delirious as these worried beasts, his wars dance to the titan carcass of a drum. While he calls courage still that native dread of the white peace contracted by the dead. After the harrowing imagery of the last few lines, the poet returns to a very neutral image of a typical hunt in the African forest where beaters are scaring ibises. Ibises are African wading birds. And these birds, when they fly out, it looks like white dust. Beaters uh, are a part of the hunting group who create loud noises, usually by beating on their drums, to scare the animals from their hiding spots within the forest. And as the animals rush out on hearing the sound, they are hunted by the hunters. Thus, the imagery becomes more and more sinister. The birds and animals are the natural inhabitants of the forest. Their cries have echoed in the forest since the beginning of civilization. Therefore, what right does human beings have to hunt them? The question is not asked, but it is implied. The violence of beasts can be read as an instinct for survival. In the natural world, violence establishes the survival of the fittest. Animals hunt to eat and to ensure their safety. This natural order is toppled by the unnatural violence perpetrated by human beings. The phrase upright man is used very ironically. Though man walks upright, he is worse than the animals who walk on all fours or crouch or crawl. And though man considers himself to be an upright and just being, his intentions are evil and more beastly than the beast. Man plays God with the natural order by inflicting pain on his fellow beings and other animals. He assumes a divinity by his sadistic designs on others. Far hungry humans are motivated by the lust for absolute control. Man is compared to the delirious or hysterical beast that rush out of the undergrowth. The animals are disturbed and frantic because the sound made by the beaters have scared them. But humans have no such excuses. Being delirious is a natural state for them and this is the reason for their innumerable acts of violence. They dance to the mad tunes of a drum. A drum is an instrument of music that is ironically fashioned out of the dead skin of an animal covering a cylinder. The poet questions the values of courage and peace. When does a man become courageous? How does a man attain peace? In the human world, courage is often linked with violence and peace is often a convenient option when the opposition has crumbled. The poet also seems to be implying that the natives are scared of the idea of peace put forward by the whites. And this white peace is caused by a lot of deaths. Therefore, is it really peace? Again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. Again, a waste of our compassion, as with Spain. The guerrilla wrestles with the superman. I, who am poisoned with the blood of both, where shall I turn, divided to the bane? I, who have cursed the drunken officer of British rule, how choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? Betray them both, or give back what they give? How can I face its slaughter and be cool? How can I turn from Africa and live? The poet comments on how the colonizers justified their violence as a brutish necessity. This is possibly a reference to how the Mau Mau rebels were suppressed. Or it could uh, even be a reference to how the colonizers perpetrated a vicious chain of violence on the colonized, all in the name of culture and progress. They have tried to assert their version 
by glossing over their atrocities, but the poet says that their reasons are far from noble. And the poet says, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. He is referring to the fact that no matter how many reasons the colonizers can come up with, it remains without saying that their actions are cruel and dirty. It's a reference to colonialism and its aftermath. And then he says, a waste of a compassion as with Spain. The colonizers and their supporters probably feel that they should not waste their sympathy on the rebels who deserve the punishment that was meted out to them. The poet thoroughly disapproves of such callousness and cites another example from human history. During the Spanish Civil War between the Nationalists and the Republicans, many European countries sought to avoid another war and signed a non-intervention pact. However, Germany and Italy covertly supported the Nationalists and supplied them with arms. The Republicans also received support from other quarters. Uh, for example, uh, Russia offered them arms, but they did not get the kind of support that the Nationalists got. And what happened was that the Republicans suffered a very painful defeat. Though many European leaders understood the situation, they refused to intercede. By drawing a comparison between the Mau Mau Rebellion and the Spanish Civil War, Walcott is asserting the universality of human strife. In Africa, the strife is between the guerrilla and the superman. A guerrilla is a negative and bestial term, a derogatory term used for the rebels, but it also symbolizes raw animal power. And Superman is again used uh, derogatively. It refers to the artificially enhanced power of the European colonizer. The outcome of this strife will never be fair as the guerrilla can never match the prowess of the Superman. Walcott is perhaps hinting at the unequal balance of power that existed between the colonizer and the colonized. The colonial powers with their superior weaponry squashed all native insurgencies with an iron hand. Now the poet moves on to the internal conflict that he faced. His identity is a curious amalgam of both his African lineage and his colonial upbringing. He cannot renounce either as he needs both. He acknowledges that he finds it difficult to choose as his loyalties are divided. He opposes British colonialism and its turbulent reign in Africa, but he cannot denounce his English tongue. He cannot justify the violence displayed by the Mau Mau rebels, but he cannot turn his back on the injustices that gave rise to the rebellion in the first place. The poet reiterates that he cannot discard his African identity or his English tongue as both are crucial to his identity. So that's all for now. Thank you.